and we've talked about this before, but I think if you are typecasted as the villain, as a bad guy in movies, TV shows, you have to be like a genuine good hearted person to get away with that. Is Kevin Spacey the exception or how does that work? I don't You know, moving good moving question. on. Good, good question. question. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of I Finally Watched. I'm Milan. And this is David. And today we finally watched Do the Right Thing. And I... uh, what you've all been waiting for is two white guys to talk to you about Do the Right Thing. Uh, <laughs> it's the doing... social commentary that's really needed in this uh, day and age. <laughs> um, the, Our the opinions thing... matter. <laughs> the thing is, though, is that um, I, I just kind of realized that I have not seen a lot of Spike Lee movies, but Do the Right Thing has been on my radar for like years. I, I was doing this junior project back in college. That's like 12 years ago. Um, and so we were doing this uh, film test, like this camera test to how to like properly show how hot a scene is. Um, in a movie make, so it's like you make it orange right like yeah yeah you just you make it orange like it's mexico no 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 so it's like it's well lighting is part of it and then in in post you have color correction obviously but then it's like how to make your characters sweat and then the kind of um there's this thing and it's and it's in do the right thing where the camera it's on the three guys on the bright red brick wall behind them and i love that shot um and it's like the i don't know how to the steam or the the like the heat waves coming off of the sidewalk so it like makes all the the people wavy um and so yeah so they were like trying to describe me that scene and i was like i don't know what you're talking about and they're like you've never seen do the right thing i was like no so 12 years i was like i need to sit down (laughs) and watch it and now i finally watched it yeah so for spike movies i think i think i probably got into spike lee with inside man right and so before that like of his movies i knew i knew that he did do the right thing and malcolm x you know, I'm obviously like a little young when he was coming up. Um, so I started with Inside Man and then uh, Miracle at St. Anna, which was his next movie, which was kind of much maligned. There's a lot of like spike movies that like really have like poor ratings, but I'm going to go through them all and I'll let you know. <laughs> um, and so like this, you know, I was, you know, obviously like Inside Man's like one of my favorite movies. And so it's like, you know, kind of got to go back through it. Inside Man also like, you know, obviously has, you know, Spike Lee deals with a lot of like, you know, racial topics in his movies. Um, and sure. like in- Inside Man deals with that too, but kind of in a funnier way. And it's really like part of the plot and like part, you know, there's still, it's like a very plot driven thriller movie. And so going back to some of his more kind of, I, I mean, for lack of a better term, for his more important stuff. Um, no, I wanted to. And so we're doing a whole month. We're doing this Malcolm X once again. <laughs> it's us two talking about uh, Malcolm X, uh, 25th Hour, Miracle at St. Anna. and Jungle Randy. Fever. No, we're not. <laughs> I mean, maybe one day. Uh, and then Black Klansman. Yeah. And so I, in the middle of the pandemic watched she's got to have it which is his first movie and i like i don't know that i necessarily enjoyed it because it's it's very like watch it huh (laughs) watch what you say well no 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 like i didn't know what i was going into and i think it's a very kind of experimental movie there's a lot of um just the characters talking to the camera, kind of explaining their motivations and things like that. It's very interesting. And, um, 
it's one that's like stuck with me if I didn't I wasn't like what you know what am I watching here there's and, there's some of that too there's some first person POV and do the right thing but it's it's very stylized with like a purpose too which I found interesting and that his first movie was very stylized as well it was very well done it looked it was you know made in 1986 and it looked great um and so it's one that I definitely have to revisit this one I, so for the whole movie I was like, I'm pretty sure something bad happens in this, but I didn't know what. <laughs> I was kind of the same way. It's, from what I've heard about it, I thought like the end of the movie was the whole movie. Like the animosity and everything was throughout. And uh, and I was like, oh, like I think I called you. I was like 20 minutes before finishing. I was like, I like no, 20 minutes in, I called you and I was like, I really like this movie. And then 20 minutes before finishing, my thought was like, wow, this movie is so great. So nice. <laughs> and then the end. And I think like the way it's, you know, as I was watching it, I was just like, yeah, this is like kind of just a slice of life movie. It's, you know, it's a 24 hour period in bed Brooklyn. And it's just these people's lives, the intermingling. There's a lot of, you know, People that just say what they mean and say some things that, you know, are maybe insensitive racially. You know, there's a Korean shop owner. Sal is an Italian pizzeria guy. And then you have just the black residents and there's some there's some Puerto Rican residents here and there. Right. And it's just like a day in their life, the hottest day in New York. And so, like, I kind of got lulled into a false sense of like, oh, so this is just a slice of life movie. <laughs> you know and what it, it kind of... Just real quick, you know what it kind of reminded me of? If you ever watched Hey Arnold as a kid uh, yeah. growing up, there's this one episode where it's like really, really fucking hot. And um, there's a scene. Well, everyone's like like dying. And there's like the fire hydrant scene, like getting the fire hydrant off. And there, there's one where he goes down to the market, he gets like a bag of ice. But then by the time he walks it back, it's like a fucking bag of water. And I was like the whole movie. I was like, that's just like that Hey Arnold episode. <laughs> Who who did it better? Who do you think? Oh, yeah. Hey, Arnold. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Especially with the racial political commentary, too. So. I like that you popped, had to pop in with your Hey, Arnold while I was doing this. But hey, Arnold. So I get sort of lulled in this false sense of like, oh, this is just like kind of a nice movie. And like, yeah, there's yeah. some antagonism between Sal Buggy and, out. and his sons and the community. And then the end happens and it was sort of like a gut punch. And I kind of like watching it almost like physically hurt to watch like someone have the life choked out of them, even though, you know, it's not real because, you know, it's happened so much. And. I th it's crazy. How effective this movie is later, and I think that definitely has a lot to do with you know, recent. What do you, what do you mean by that? Just how impactful the movie is. You know, the movie was made in kind of a commentary to a certain incident, right? And like, obviously, there's a lot of incidents like this. But, you know, they start chanting Howard Beach, which was um, I looked into and it's uh, some white kids in a pizzeria pizzeria chased some black guys. I don't know if they're kids, um, young adults or adults, whatever chase. They were beating up and chasing some black guys. And one of the guys in running away got hit by a car and killed and so this movie was made sort of in commentary of that and taken some of the events of that but then just stylized it into its own story yeah um but watching this i mean it's very like this movie is very reminiscent of i think it was either what 2018 2019 eric garner who was like choked out by a police officer in new york and died for selling even, cigarettes even george floyd Exactly. I guess what I'm saying is, and it's it's a sad thing that it's like a movie that's still like is like relevant. You could, but like you could be like, oh, this was made in in comment of this event or this event because they keep happening, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And I guess like when I was watching it last night, after that part happened, after sort of the they ransacked Sal's Pizzeria, I just like. I just sort of like paused it and just was like kind of sitting there. And I was like, I just have to go to bed. And I was like, you know, there's like 15 minutes left, which with end credits, there's only like five minutes left. I could have easily finished it right there. But 
so when I'm watching the movie the whole time, I'm like, I'm really enjoying this. This is a great slice of, slice of life movie. And it's funny that like, I could have been lulled into that false sense of like, oh, this is, you know, this is just a nice movie. And then when the end happens, I think then it like hit me like, oh, this is why do the right thing is what it is. This is why it's held in such high regard. Like nominated for like best written and best best original screenplay, I believe. Yeah, it was original. Yes. And so I don't know. That was just sort of the the way it made me feel. I was in watching like the first hour and a half of it. I was like, I don't know how we're going to talk about this. But I think it, I mean, obviously it'll be definitely more global, but I mean, it's just, I don't know, man, it was a very affecting movie and it's like one going into, you're like, oh, you know, like, is it gonna, is it gonna kind of live up to it because, you know, you've known about it for so long and it's like, it's an older movie. You know how I feel about movies made in the late eighties, early nineties, but this is like the exception to that where this is movie is sort of timeless right like it just I, so you and i both have the and i'm now i'm just talking a lot but you and i both have the criterion version of this mm-hmm, yep and it looks fucking amazing too it, it like does. just it just looked so good um when the uh the beginning of this movie is happening uh it draws you in in such a such a positive way it's basically it's rosie perez doing interpretive dance but like almost like crunking and then it, it's 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 uh and it's just the opening credits it's just like the names of the producers and the actors and the you know whatever but it, it's just like a music video of rosie perez dancing and it's at times I was like, oh, maybe this is lasting a little long, but it really gets you hyped for the movie. Like it just puts you in a, in a mood. And the more I'm thinking about it, I was like, man, more movies should start with Rosie Perez. Absolutely breaking it the fuck down. Um, do no, but what, what, do you know what movie inspired the beginning of that? I always what? get on to you for asking questions that I won't know the answer to. It's bye bye birdie. Oh, Okay, I've which obviously is probably the dancing in the beginning of that for the credits is probably a lot different. I just I I think I've never seen Bye Bye Birdie, but I just love the thought of like him seeing a movie like that and like I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it this way. And um, yeah, it it also is what I noticed, too. So I started the movie. I watched like 20 minutes of it and then I had to I had to stop because of kids and life. And so then the next day I just started over. And one thing you notice in that is like the movie that's playing the public enemy song that's playing in the beginning is the same song that Radio Rahim is playing the entire fucking movie on his boombox. Oh, is it the entire time? I knew it was in the last scene. I didn't know it was the entire time. Well, because he tells uh, Buggin' Out, he's like, why would I play anything else? You know, this is the this is the best. Why would I play anything else? And so um, it's just I don't know it. Yeah, I, I like the opening. Um and because this is also in a time when I don't know if the rules still required it at this point, but I, you know, movies used to have to have the opening credits, right? Like you had to have the credits before the movie. And I think that probably had a lot to do with a lot of the guilds wanting their people yeah. to get credit before the movie. Cause they knew people. Would I don't stay. know when that changed. If there was like a doctrine coming out, it's like, you don't, you don't have to do that anymore. I remember I thought it was with like the Godfather got like an exemption to not do it. And then it slowly changed after that. And this oh, is obviously ap- during that time, like 16, okay. 17 years after um, it might've not been the Godfather. I can't remember because the Godfather probably had those opening credits too. Anyway, I like that. And then we sort of get into the, the movie. Um, you know, I guess one thing I want to say too, before we start <laughs> Once again, always doing that thing where we act like we're going to start going through the movie and we don't. I always thought that this movie was going to be good in spite of Spike Lee's acting. <laughs> he was he was actually really great in it. Yeah, I actually didn't even know it was him. I was like, wow, I've never seen this kid act in anything after this. <laughs> I wonder before. what happens to this young guy. He's, uh, he's, <laughs> I he's wonder what it. happened to this up and coming uh, star. And then the end credits rolled and it's like, 
Mookie played by Spike Lee. And I was like, oh, fuck, of course. And then like and I've only seen Spike Lee and like as he is now an old man. Um, and and but now looking at him and thinking, I was like, oh, of course, they look. They look like the older, younger version of each other because they are. Um, but yeah, I think he's I think he did really well. And he played a character who was, I guess you could safely say, was the main character of the movie. Although the screen time was shared by so many equally important characters to this film. Yeah, it's definitely like an ensemble piece. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I think you could say that Mookie was the main character because he was kind of the catalytic drive that connected all these people in this like one area. And at the same time, he was this is going to come off as a negative, but it really isn't bland enough to let everyone else shine through, if that makes sense. No, yeah, he didn't overshadow things, which is funny because when we get to the like the alternate casting at the end of this, there were some people who would have overshadowed the movie if they'd gotten parts. Um, which speaking of which you then have Samuel L. Jackson as the DJ <laughs> who is basically acts a little bit as like a narrator and sort of a scene setter for a lot of this. And like in the beginning, it's just like, Hey, it's hot as shit right now, guys. And there's a water shortage. So you shouldn't yeah. even be using your water. Um, and I think obviously like when you, you need that, but when you read the synopsis of it, the the movie like the movie synopsis that I read before it started is like on the hottest day in New York. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, even after that, you pan the newspapers and like in all the different newspapers and all the different languages, um, it's it's hot as shit, right? That's that's how you gotta know. Also, can we talk about Samuel L. Jackson's radio show setup because mm-hmm. it's it's like a sound booth. But the window to the sound booth where he's recording faces out into the street. And so he's basically just reporting on exactly what's happening, what he can see. You know, what? I also like the nice detail, too. And I'm pretty sure this is how it works. This is how I took it. Um, He's like, you know, we're on 108, whatever, at the very end of your radio dial. And I'm pretty sure at the very end is like the shittier of the frequencies, right? Like at the beginning and end, it's like where they don't work as well. And so he's this like kind of local person who works in this very limited area because that's the frequency he's gotten. It, it's also funny to be making a podcast about this because it's kind of like what we do or like what other podcasters do is like report on things we witness and experience and, and, and say, but like there's no, um, like for a radio, there's like certain channels and certain, um, you know, listen to it or not but then with podcasts how things have progressed from radio to now it's like there's millions there's not just like a set of number of channels anymore yeah there's not that and i think that that's i mean that's an interesting discussion too about how there were just like the you know the four or five channels you had in the local broadcasting then and then there was cable However far your satellite can reach or not reach. And now that's morphed into streaming where it's just, you know, fucking computers and shit. And I don't understand how any of that works. <laughs> we next meet Sal, the pizza shop owner. Um, John Totoro as Pino um, yeah. is great in this movie. He, John Totoro. Sal. Sal was great. Dude, I didn't even know he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor of that year. And I was watching him and I was like, because I know that actor from other things. I'm watching him and I'm just like, I'm buying into everything he's saying. And then I learned he's, he got nommed for Best Supporting Actor. I was like, very well deserved. Which he might have like the most screen time in the movie. I think he does. I think either he does or maybe John Turturro does too. Yeah, I don't know. John Turturro playing just like a completely deplorable character. We only do movies where he plays like horrible people. Maybe that's all he does. Maybe that's all he does. Um, I like that the opening, he's like, Pino sweep out front, Vito, you sweep. And then Pino's like, I fucking hate this place. And he he actually says, I'm going to kill somebody today, which is funny. Not haha funny. But when ironic. he said, you can say I, ironic. I wrote that down because I was like, oh, so that's what he like. He's the one. And it's actually 
He's not involved at all. And no. I think that's obviously purposeful that the most detestable character is not the one, is not involved in what causes the death of, of Radio Rahim, right? Like it's it's the guy, Sal is like, you're like, oh, that guy, he, that's a good guy, right? He's not racist. He's not, you know what I mean? He's he's not a bad guy. And But, um, but honestly, it wasn't really his fault either. Let's, we'll get that. We'll get to that in the end. Um, and what I what I think... That racist is, cop's fault. Go ahead. Well, I mean, yes, but I think you can spread blame, too. Because, I mean, it's also a little bit... I mean, radio's a little bit bugging out. Oh, of course, like, yeah. Oh, but it, Sal also takes some responsibility for screaming racial we'll, we'll talk epi- about it. epitaphs we'll talk about, at people. We'll talk about it later. So, um, we next meet Spike Lee and his sister. That's his real sister playing that character, and she's very good I wondered... Movie. I wondered if it was his real sister because I was like, they look too, they look too much like siblings to be fake siblings, right? Um, and we meet mother sister, and then Mookie gets to work, and he's late, even though it looks like he lives half a block away from this pizza place. Um, and then he Pino asks him to sweep, he refuses. He's like, I'm the delivery guy. That's all I do. And then we meet Demer, and Demer gets a dollar which I think also pays for a Miller High Life, but he gets a dollar to sweep the front. Yeah, yeah. And Pino's pissed. He's like, why are you paying that guy a dollar? And it's like, Pino, because you won't fucking, like, you don't do it. None of you are, you're all too good to do this. So he pays this guy a dollar to do your job. What what it establishes too, and this movie is great in the way that no one really fits a stereotype. No one really fits a trope. Everyone is layered and they have their wants, needs, and, and feelings. And the thing with Sal, and Sal is probably the most in-depth character. Maybe, maybe Mookie too. But with with uh, with Sal, you get that he has a heart, right? He cares for these people, and he gets frustrated, and he gets you know bogged down with all the shit that's brought in there sometimes. But he has a heart about it, probably mostly for uh, Mookie's sister, but. Um, but he cares, right? And then you have his son, uh, John Turturro's character, just really just a racist piece of shit that just really hates everyone. But even at the end, and it's it's the acting that they do in their eyes. And you can tell that John Turturro's character has a bit of a change of heart towards the end. It's not an extreme one, but it's and it's not enough to redeem him and all the heinous shit he says. Definitely not. But it's it's something you see a turn in him. And it's when his dad goes, maybe I'll call it Sal and Sons because you'll have it, you know, eventually. And that's actually I thought that was foreshadowing of Sal's going to die, especially the fight breaking out right afterwards. But. um, But you see a moment in in John Turturro's character being like. Oh, maybe this isn't all bad. Yeah, I don't know what specific answer you're talking about, but we'll get to it more when we get to it. So, uh, we next meet Ahmad and his group, and uh, Martin Lawrence is part of this and looking real fucking young. Yeah, and like he, <laughs> I don't know, it just uh, it was just jarring to see him so young it, and skinny like super skinny super and, skinny and it was as if someone was doing a martin lawrence impression because his voice was so martin lawrence in this <laughs> it's like the only really thing well the it's not the only thing i've seen martin lawrence and but it's the first thing i've seen martin lawrence and is bad boys and bad boys too right? right and it's that scene where will smith makes fun of him i guess it's either for having too big a ears for his head or having too big a head for his body but I just couldn't help thinking that while watching him in this movie. Well, they make fun of his ears in this movie, too. They should have made fun of his head. Well, I don't know. Big, big um, motherfucking head. We also meet Radio Rahim. And we then get a... Uh, I don't know if you call it a funny scene. Where Demer is trying to buy a Miller High Life from the Korean grocery store. And he's like, this ain't Korea or China or whatever. And he's like, you're asking a lot to make a man change his beer. And I think what makes this movie great is it has, and if you read interviews from Spike Lee, it has a somewhat particular point of view about the events in the movie. 
but the movie also really works in the gray, right? Yes, yes, exactly. And it, it also in a in a in a way that plays more in the '90s and the early 2000s. It shows people sort of saying kind of deplorable things, but like as a as just a human being who's lived in the world, you can sort of tell the difference between the really bad and just the people who just talk shit and like, yeah. So for example, um, the three black guys that are just sort of sitting on the umbrella the whole time. I knew you were going to bring that up. They talk a lot of shit about everybody. They talk about all these businesses that are not black owned in the neighborhood. But then when push comes to shove, you know, one of them stops them from burning down the Korean store at the end. You know, when they're asked to boycott Sal's, they tell them to fuck off. Like, you know, what are you talking about? Even though they had gotten into it with Pino earlier in the day for him, um, you know, pushing Smiley, right? Right. And so, so the movie is of its time in that I don't really think you could show all your characters acting very subtly racist, but still be like, oh, well, you know, that's just how it is, right? Um but I think this movie in that way sort of is like, like I said, it's kind of painting in, in the gray of like, you know, there's a lot of people who kind of, there's a lot of people to blame for certain things in this movie. There's a lot of people who aren't perfect in this movie. Um, you, you honestly didn't even bring up what I thought you were going to bring up where people like say like racist things, but it's the context and it's the meaning behind it. When you said the three black guys, sitting along the wall when uh when they're talking about the korean market he's like i'm gonna do something about it he's like you ain't gonna do shit about it and then the one guy gets up he's like i'm gonna get some beer and he goes up to the guy he goes hey tofu no he says hey kung fu oh he says kung fu yeah even worse (laughs) oh that is worse yeah tofu at least i don't know well no because yeah no i don't know tofu's bad too dude both bad Both, both bad both bad um, so next we get Demare um, and mother sister sort of have a conversation where she tells him basically to fuck off. Those two, husband and wife. Wow. Um, yeah, and he, originally they tried to get someone else for Demare, who I'll tell you about later. Um, hmm. We meet Rosie Perez. Her mom won't babysit, and it doesn't connect till later to me. I assume she was involved with Spike Lee's character, but we find out later that he's you know that's his son, and um, you know they sort of have an on and off thing. It seems like. I want to talk about so we do we now meet the three um black guys. It's <laughs> ML, Coconut Sid, and Sweet Dick Willie. Um <laughs> I knew one of them's name was Coconut because they said it, but I don't know. Well, maybe they did say the other ones. So apparently all the scenes that they're involved in were improvised. I love the like just the idea of some guy talking shit about how he's not scared of Mike Tyson, I find hilarious. But then his it's conversation of, that it's a conversation that three men in their sixties would have today. Well, no, today they'd ask how many eight year olds they could take if the eight year olds had scissors. But um, and beyond Joe Rogan, I love the line that he says: "If Mike Tyson dreamed about hitting me, he better wake up and apologize." Which I don't know if that's just a common line during this time, or if QT was paying homage with Reservoir Dogs to this line reading. Um, but I I don't know I liked hearing it again and I just it made me it made me kind of laugh, um, and then we meet Giancarlo, um, which a lot of the stuff I read pointed out that him getting mad about Italian Americans on the board was ironic because he's half Italian in real life. Oh, that's um, funny. Uh, so he goes in to buy pizza. Extra cheese is two dollars, which I'm still like, man, that's just so fucking cheap. Like for a slice of pizza now, <laughs> like I guess well, not really. I mean, the slice of pizza is a dollar fifty, and having extra cheese on it makes it three fifty. That's kind of a ridiculous upcharge. No, 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 no. The two dollars was the total. It wasn't two dollars in addition. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. I'm very positive. He says ask- two dollars extra. I'll ask no 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 no. I'll ask Spike next time I talk to him. But it was two dollars though. You know, speaking of meeting meeting celebrities, I uh, I didn't like formally meet Giancarlo Esposito, but I saw him at a Comic Con last year, and he's walking out like it's the end of the con, and people are swarming his booth, begging to take a picture. You got to pay like 50, 60 bucks to take a picture with him. 
He just gets out from behind his booth and starts taking photos and autographs to anyone who wanted one and came up to him. He just seemed like the nicest fucking dude. And he now, since he's older, he just plays deplorable characters. But um, I think and we've talked about this before, but I think if you are typecasted as the villain, as a bad guy in movies, TV shows, you have to be like a genuine good hearted person to get away with that. Is Kevin Spacey the exception or how does that work? I don't You know, moving good moving good on question. good question so, so this, next part, on. <laughs> this next part of the Giancarlo whose name is bugging out um which is also three syllables so i was like how do i shorten this i'm just gonna say bugging um bugging out so he's buggy out it's bugging if you also bugging. look it up yep. so because he's bugging out yeah I get it. he does in the movie so there's this central conflict that I didn't realize it was the central conflict when it starts out of him saying like, why are there not black people on this wall? Why is it all Italian Americans? And I was like, surely that's not going to come up again. And it, it does. It's the central if you thesis read, of the movie. It is. If you read like the Wikipedia synopsis of the movie, it's uh, when Mookie's friend bugging out goes into the Italian restaurant owned by Sal, he complains about the thing which starts a racist fire within the neighborhood. I was like, Oh, it's a whole movie. It is. Well, I mean, it is a... I think the movie is very simple in its premise, and it is elongated for two hours because you're just getting a very good feel of the neighborhood, too, along with it. There's a lot of, like, not subplots, but there's a lot of scenes that maybe don't add to that, but they add to the overall time and place of of this neighborhood, which I think is, like, one of the best parts of the film when bugging out mentions there's no african-americans on the wall of fame in sal's restaurant to the point where they come back at the end of the movie about it you have moments throughout the movie where he's trying to boycott and get people behind his boycott on sal's but other than that there is no mention and no conflict of this Right. Well, because he he keeps doing it. It's not working. You feel like he's going to keep giving up, um, but he doesn't. So he kicks him out and he's like, we're going to boycott Sal's. And Mookie comes up to him. He's like, you need to shut the fuck up. You're going to fuck my job up. And he's like, do not come back for a week. Um, And then (laughs) we get the name of the movie. The mayor says, always do the right thing. And I was like, ah, it's great. It's great to have it. Which apparently. No one knew. We have. We have this conversation all the time about does the title of the movie come first and it gets put in the movie? And I'm always like, surely they take it from the movie. But I read in an interview, Spike says the first idea he had for the movie was the title. So then that means he purposely put it in this movie to have it in here. It actually makes really good sense for it to happen that way for this movie, particularly because the whole theme, like the motif of the of the movie that gets very detailed in the end is do you sit there and do you do the right thing or do you sit there and do you let the bad things happen and so for him to be like all right i'm making this movie about this and i wanted to be called do the right thing that makes way more sense to me and then after this we get kind of just a montage of different ways people are dealing with the heat um you know they open the fire hydrants which was a really cool scene it was well shot Radio Rahim comes up and they all talk shit to him, but they also seem to be like afraid of him. Right. Cause like there's a guy that comes up right after this and they spray the dude's car completely soaking it. Cause he was like over the top about don't spray my car. Don't spray my car. Don't spray my car. And it's like, if you tell someone 17 times not to do something, eventually they're going to be like, all right, well you've now offended me. (laughs) So there's a couple, there's a couple of things there, right? Because he has that like beatbox, beatbox, boom box, um showdown with the puerto ricans with their boombox right but then radio rahim's is bigger it's bigger it's louder and he just got new batteries for it too i think and um or maybe that happened after but then he walks through and martin lawrence is with the hose which i really like the detail of them of them um what like uh 
smoothing sanding, out the cans. Yeah, smoothing out the cans on the sidewalk. But um, it's almost like maybe it's fear. I took it more as like a sign of respect. Well, yeah, as they talk shit to him. By the way, when you said he was Martin Lawrence was with the hose, I was like, why would you call those women that? But I realized you're talking about the cans. <laughs> I'm talking um, about the fire hydrant. Yeah. I love when they spray the dude's car and you have Officer Ponty, which I don't know that I hear his name, but who's played by Miguel Sandoval. And the guy's like, I want people arrested. And he's like, what are their names? He's like, no and Joe. He's like, no and Joe. What's the last name? Black. And he's like, oh, so they're brothers. <laughs> like just completely fucking with the guy. And then they just get off and leave. Um, and I, I don't know. That scene is, is just, it's like, it's almost a non sequitur, but it's just really funny. And then we next get the scene where M- Mookie tells Vito that he needs to kick Pino's ass. Um, well, that, that scene with the, with the car soaking is important in the sense of it introduces those two cop characters. Has, the cops. That's how we, yeah. That's how we get introduced to them. So officer long, the white cop who is also, the murderer at the end um, is Rick Aiello, the son of Danny Aiello, who plays Sal. Oh, which is also pretty kind of funny. Like, Sisters, you know, one one committed the murder, the other is also like oh. somewhat culpable for it. Um, I thought you were gonna say it's funny because like you got a couple in this movie that are brother and sister in the movie, but in real life you got a couple that's married in real life and that in, I guess end up together at the end of the movie. And then you got a father and son character and one of the, sorry, you got the father and son in real life, but then one of the fathers, the whole premise is he has sons in this movie. So, so uh, Mookie tells Vito to kick Pino's ass and Vito's like, do you think it might help? <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't, it leads to a conversation between Vito and Pino late later, but it's a doesn't, storage locker, right? But it doesn't have like a far reaching consequence for the end of the movie. Um, there's then one of the oddest scenes in this movie, but I think there's an ex. I don't know. Tim, it's funny, like reading some of Spike Lee talking about the movie because he. In the way he talked about it in the couple of interviews I read, I think one, like I said, he paints this movie very gray, but I think two, he also has a strict point of view of like the way he sees it. And it was like maybe slightly different than the way I saw it. Um, but like, so Radio Rahim has a boombox battle with some Puerto Rican guys. Where yeah. It's like whose boombox is louder and he wins. And to me, the point of that movie is to show a little bit of not culpability, like Radio Rahim's culpability in what happens to him, but showing like his decision making eventually led him into a situation where he was murdered. You know what I mean? So like, he's, I, it's interesting. He's yeah. constantly trying to get into fights with people. It's interesting because for do the right thing you couldn't have a non-black director direct the same movie and you can't say you can't i mean you can right you can do anything you want it's america it's a free country um but it it would be vastly inappropriate i guess to have someone other than african-american make a movie about an african-american getting murdered by white police officers and also subtly saying, but if you turn into a rage mob, that isn't the right thing to do either. Everyone's culpable. Everyone's at fault. No one is like a saint, which is a great message. And it's a true message. But to be in that world and to say that you got to be real careful. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk more about the ending. Um, so... What he next delivers to Samuel Jackson, he delivers the whatever the food is, and then he gives a shout out to Tina, and then we get the scene where Buggin gets oh. into it with a white guy that stepped onto his shoes. Can we talk about how they're talking? Um, I think it's Vito and Mookie talking in front of um, Sam Jackson's radio studio. You could see him behind in the background, like being like, "Hey, I'm thirsty." <laughs> yeah, he's like, fucking can you guys- talking. Can you fucking come in here? Hey, can you guys get over here? And 
it I think this scene is in here one to just kind of further explore bugging outs like frustration right because he's he's sort of like he has like an activist mindset right and i think spike lee's sister later on in the movie says like you have like well what's that it's that it's that meme uh it's like the will smith carlton meme like oh he's got the he's, he's got his spirits in the right place right like it's but you know what i mean so it's like she's like you know i like where your head's at but i think you're picking the wrong battles right you know, yeah. so this guy steps on his shoes. It happens to be a white guy also wearing a Larry Bird jersey, which I found very funny. Whenever yeah. I've played basketball and I can shoot, um, the if there are black guys around that see me shoot and I make some, they always fucking call me Larry Bird <laughs> every time. I think you mentioned this during our uh, White Men Can't Jump episode. It's just a common thing. It just happens. If you're if you're a white guy that can shirt, that's like um, uh, what's that movie? Um, it's with Paul Rudd and um, the guy from. Anyway, he's like you white, you Ben Affleck. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah, movie. yeah. So um, yeah, he gets into it with that guy, and the guy he's like, you know, I'm fucking tired of gentrification. And one, it's just to make a point about gentrification, which. I think is, you know, probably even gotten gone a little bit farther in that area now. And two, to kind of explore further his frustration with like, you know, shit happening that he doesn't like, you know, like Sal making money off black people, but not sort of showing kind of support to black people too, right? Like these are the people, you know, you can't, I mean, Sal at one point in the movie says like, I can't open a pizzeria in our area of town because there's too many. So he has to go to this area to do it. You're making your livelihood off of black people and you can't put a single black person on your wall. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this reminds me of, uh, there's a moment in the Sopranos. I know you've never seen the Sopranos, but it's, um, you know, like the mob, they do shakedowns and they do like, you know, you, you pay us for protection, but the only, the only protection you're paying for is from them themselves. Right. <laughs> right. And, um, there's like this new, coffee place in town like that opened up and so they have to go around they have to introduce themselves and they have to go hey listen you got to pay us this for protection we'll kick your ass burn your place down and um it's like a fucking starbucks and i mean <laughs> it's <laughs> and the kid is like a manager there right he's like he's like whatever he's like i don't i don't know i don't understand what you're talking about you're going to pay us. He's like, I don't think I'm allowed to take cash out of the register unless you buy something. And so they can't comprehend that he has like a corporate head to answer to. So they all of a sudden find themselves like not being able to benefit off of small businesses because everything is being gentrified into like huge corporate thing. I I don't know. It was no, funny. That's, that's actually hilarious. Yeah. Um, And I'm not just saying that in a, to move on point away no, that's, that's actually, actually a very funny point. really hilarious it's i'm dying on the inside so um we can actually get this part where uh he's you know they go back and uh pino can kind of sense that mookie's been talking to Vito about like not taking shit from him and he's like you know stay out of my business with my brother and they sort of have this argument which is also like a it's also like a very common point at this point in life i don't know how you know this movie came out, I was two, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> but he's basically like, Pino, you hate black people, but all your favorite people are black people. You know, Prince, which he argues like, nah, the boss, Bruce Springsteen. He's like, no, man, you fucking love Prince. Um, and it is just a common thing. Like, you like the things that black people create, but you hate black people. And we do get to the bottom of Pino hates black people because of the people he's around talking shit about black people right like or at least that's like his excuse that's you know put out there in the movie there's also this this part of the movie um where it does this first po person pov and it's like a different character talking shit about like so what mookie talks shit about italians pino talks shit about black people like really vitriolic racist shit yeah and then it, it goes through to the cop and then the puerto rican guys and then the, about Korean, the Korean guys and then the, the Korean Cor guys. The, and then the Korean guy, I was like, it went on for a little bit before I realized he was talking about Jewish people. Like, I was like, I don't know who, I don't know who you're like, I don't know who you're being racist towards right now. Right. Um, 
And then we get Demare asking for a beer and he asks for a kid to buy him a beer. And then Ahmad and his group just comes up and completely eviscerates him. And he's like, you know, you don't fucking judge me. You don't understand like the pain and my five kids that couldn't eat and I couldn't get a job. And Ahmad's like, no, mo- yeah, motherfucker. I would never understand that because I wouldn't let it happen, which is it's judgmental. It's also like, I mean, we don't know exactly what happened in Demare's life. Um, I don't know, but it is like that scene. I was like, damn, man, maybe Demare should have been nominated, too, because that's fucking it was really great. Yeah, he was tearing up and everything. I, I felt I felt for him. I felt bad for him. Um, and then uh, Tina asks uh, Mookie if he loves her because she orders some food from him. And then we get the um, your favorite scene, the ice cube. OK, first of all, it's not my favorite ski- scene. Oh, we're it's not there scene. yet. This is over the it's phone. a scene that surprised your- me quite a bit because I didn't I didn't expect it uh, coming. Um, expect me coming either, if you know what I'm saying. Um, but the thing is, though, is. I love the line where he delivers her the pizza and they act like complete strangers, right? It's that that trope, but the things that they say, so she goes, you deliver the pizza cold. He's like, I never deliver the pizza cold. And then he throws it to the side. Yeah. I love it. It's great. So we also get this part. I think we need to skip ahead. Like, cause there's a lot of just stuff that's yeah, still, yeah, I agree. But I mean, so, one point is Mookie asks if he can get paid early and it kind of just sets up that that's all Mookie cares about. Right. Like in his life. I mean, it's, it's further set up by the fact that he's not around his son. He doesn't visit Tina that often. She like, doesn't even want to let him leave. Cause she's like, you're just, I'm never going to fucking see you again. And it's because, I mean, and it starts out with him counting out his money in the beginning of the movie. It's all he cares about is the $250 he makes a week and how he can make more money. Um, and it sort of sets up his reaction in the end, right? Which keep saying we're going to talk about, it and we will talk about. Um, so I think maybe we should skip ahead to when his sister goes to visit Sal. Yeah, and there's also a scene where Raheem's boombox dies, and which is just once again just kind of a funny scene, but. Uh, Jade is going to go visit Sal to get some pizza. She stopped by bugging out on the way there. And it's the conversation we talked about where she's like, you need to focus your energy a little bit. She's like, I'm still going to Sal's. And um, maybe that happens after who knows, but he, go- she goes there and Sal's demeanor could not change more. <laughs> yeah. He is definitely very smitten and <laughs> fucking <laughs> Mookie takes jade outside and she's like you you can't come here anymore i can't deal with this and then he says something to sal too and sal's like i should fucking kick your ass for even insinuating it's like come on sal what do you mean but also it's not just the way mookie was looking at the two of them flirting it was the way that vino was looking at them flirting too he was not happy about it yeah and i mean i think the point of that scene too is to sort of set up you know sal has Paid Demare apparently gives him a dollar every day just so he can, you know, buy a little something for himself, normally a beer. He seems to be very smitten with Jade, who's black. You know, he helped out Demare, right? So he keeps setting up so that when the ending happens, it's just more impactful of like even this guy, you know? Um, so we get the mayor saves that little kid and he tells the mom she doesn't need to beat the kid. He's already pretty scared. And she's like, I appreciate it. Don't fucking tell me how to raise my kid. He's like, you're right. You're right. Um, You know, what's funny in the beginning of this. Demare says to mother, sister, he's like, you're going to respect me one day or something like that. You're going to be able to handle me. Even if we're even if we're even if we're dead. Yeah. I was like, are they going to (laughs) die? He's like, even if we're not living. Yeah, I think he I think he says you're going to like me. You're going to like me, you know, even if we're dead. And um she does. She she likes him by the end of the day. Yeah. So we have the ice in the whole body scene when he goes over to Tina's. I originally the there was a phone call and then it goes to this. So he gets back to Sal's and I I like this part where he's like, Sal, man, if you want me to you want me to deliver any faster, I need a rocket pack. And I love Sal's response of like, I didn't say nothing. Seems like you have a guilty conscience. What were you doing? Like I didn't say you took too long this time. So, you know, what's happening? Um, And then they are about to close. And there's a small scene before this where Bugging Out talks to Radio Raheem. 
you know, Radio Rahim uh, uh, earlier, he met with Mookie and had that conversation about his love and hate. Um, his like brass, brass knuckles, knuckles. Almost yeah. so, like, except they weren't really brass. I mean, they were like rings that covered all four hands. Anyway, um, I guess they were brass knuckles. I don't know. But yeah. what I find interesting, so bugging out talks to Radio Rahim. He's talked to other, all these other people about boycotting and they all tell him to go fuck himself. And he goes to Radio Rahim, who has been getting into it with everyone, including earlier, he played his music in Sal's and Sal told him to get the fuck out or turn it off. And he does turn it off, which is like, I don't know, it was a pretty loud boombox inside. You know, I get why he didn't want it on. Um, and then, but it's just, he's bugging out, finally gets a person who's willing to listen to him about this boycott and is willing to be like, you know, maybe we should. And you also have Radio Rahim, who has been getting into it with a lot of people today, right? And Smiley. So we lead basically to like kind of the penultimate scene um, that we've been talking about over and over. And they are about to close, right? And it's kind of like this trope of like, oh man, if they had just stayed closed. But Ahmad and Martin Lawrence, they come and they're like, we want pizza. And Sal, being the nice guy he is, he's like, these people are always, you know, they're good customers. Let's open back up. We'll feed them. Yep. And he does that. And then bugging out and Smiley. Radio Rahim. Oh, yeah. I forgot about Smiley joining the crew, too. Yeah. They come in ready for a fight. And I think it's interesting that Ahmad and his group are completely on Sal's side. They're not doing anything to help. They're completely on Sal's side. And yeah, then yeah, yeah. Sal throws out the N-word. And they're all like, what the fuck? Like, oh. And then it's just like, they're- it's over. It's over. Yeah. Do you remember why Smiley is on their side? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because of Pino. Yeah. It's just in order to move things along. That's a scene we skip. I think I mentioned it earlier. Yeah. He like starts pushing him and he's talking shit. He's talking shit to Sweet Dick Willie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pino. It's funny because Pino talks shit to Sweet Dick Willie. But then later on, Sweet Dick Willie's like, I don't know, man. Leave Sal alone. Um, and he uses the N word tells him to get out they won't leave and he takes a bat to the boom box and he, after their silence and then he's like i just fucking stopped your music and yeah. then and that's he, when radio goes and choke holds sal well he, he he grabs him by the collar and he pulls him over the counter and then they go outside um to to fight it out and it's just like it's just that kind of um kind of reminded me of a guy Ritchie film where all like the factors, like all the factions of people that you've met throughout are escalating into this like one moment. And this is the one moment of uh, the, the pop, the top's going to pop sort of thing. So they're fighting. A crowd comes around just to watch and the cops show up. And I mean, this is just like one of the rougher scenes in a movie to watch. It's just like, Everyone's screaming that you're killing the guy. His own partner saying, dude, stop choking him. And then the body just to go lifeless. Um, I think I think a more horrific moment in all of that is when they sh show the shot of his shoes off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that. Yeah, you're right, though. That's that whole scene is very hard to take in. And um then he's it's, then he's dead and then they're like we need to get this body out of here right yeah um and so this is kind of the part i wanted to talk about so the police are gone everyone's cleared out and the crowd is now like hey sal you're also to blame for this they even say i think they're like you guys called the cops which i don't think i don't know who called I don't the think cops. they did uh maybe pino or Vito did i don't know and the crowd is gathering around them, getting more and more serious. And it looks like they're about to kill these three guys. And Mookie, who has kind of been silent, takes a trash, walks up, takes a trash can and throws it through the glass. I How, think why, I know why did you're... why did he do that? That's my question. OK, so I found that very odd. Um especially for like the main character we're supposed to be rooting for. He does such a thing that kind of entices everyone else to burn the fucking place down. This, this family's livelihood essentially. Um, I was trying to find the good in it. 
I was trying to find the positive silver lining in it. So my first take on it was he did that so that the mob would focus on the place instead of the people. That's how I took it. So that's what I thought too. Um, that he, that they were about to kill Sal and Pino and Vito and that he did that to Spike said that the reason Mookie threw the can through the window was because he saw his best friend Raheem being murdered in front of him. Um, He did acknowledge the alternate theory um, that it was to save them. He said it was never his intention, but he liked that the scene sparked different interpretations. Um, Another quote from Spike Lee was, he's like, in 20 years since I made this movie, which it's been a lot longer now, but when he answered the question, he said, in the 20 years since I made this movie, not a single person of color has asked me why Mookie threw that trash can. He's like, but white people keep asking me why he did it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. I mean... So I think, I mean, the anger... You know, they never really established that Mookie and Radio Raheem were best friends. That's kind of a weird thing to say, too. Um, Yeah, but I guess that's more in the mind of the creator, right? Because he is Mookie. You know, Spike wrote this. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, sure. Who am I, who am they I do, to say? They do, have a, they do have a few scenes together, um, or at least one kind of the big one with the hate-love thing. I mean, I think it's just like the anger of his friend was just murdered in front of him and sort of the helplessness of like, I can't do anything about it. And I can't, what I'm going to go murder cops. No, I can't do that. But this guy who I also deem to be somewhat responsible for this taking it out on him. And I think it's kind of in the next scene where he goes to Sal and Sal's like, I'm not giving you your money. You fucking my window. And he's like, why do you care about your window? Raheem was killed yesterday. You know what I mean? And Sal says, well, that was, partially his fault um if he had to come in he actually says bugging out's fault if you know bugging out is responsible for that which the movie as i said i mean first of all there is one gray yeah but but there is one that this this happens a lot in a lot of situations where like a bad thing happens and there is one person that is particularly responsible for it but then we also look for all the other people who are responsible and sometimes we maybe go a little too far with that i'm not saying that's in this situation because i do think you have this character who this whole time who, like, as Buggin' Out said, has made his living off of the people in this neighborhood. And then when push comes to shove, just says horrible things to this one guy who did antagonize him. But, I mean, that shit was there, right? Like, Well, look, I think I think the point is, is that does that does that mean he deserves to be murdered? And, I, and obviously the answer is, is no. Who? Sal? Or, no, Radio Rahim. Oh well, no, right? yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I agree. No, I mean, I don't no, think anyone. I, I don't think that's don't, the question <laughs> anyone's asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying it is, and I'm not saying anyone would disagree. I'm saying that's the obvious answer to that question. And so, for being that obvious answer to that question, that's not what's put in to question here, right? That's like that's not that's not what's being considered. What's being considered is the escalation and that's what i took from the end of the movie with like the mlk um quote and the malcolm x quote coming up at the end of the movie is that how we as people black white asian whatever how we react to animosity violence judgment you know do we react it with more animosity and violence more judgment revenge or do we learn to try to get get past that get through that which is incredibly hard but i think what spike is trying to say in the movie is like that's the that's the right answer that's the right thing to do is to not fight fire with fire violence with violence but to to rise above it and to and to be better but in the movie it doesn't show anyone doing that very well so i don't know that that is the point i think the the it is a little bit of a provocation where so right now you're talking about sal's restaurant being burned and i think the people involved in that in in involved in real situations like like that were would say like that like that isn't the focus like yeah i mean i get that like there was no need to do that but i, I no, mean no i'm not like it, hold on hold on I'm just saying that I think they would say that one, that their anger is justified in this situation, 
that Sal is partially responsible and that at the, you know, the one thing that Spike does at the end of this movie is there's a, um, I don't remember if it's a news reporter or Samuel Jackson that says it, but there's some line about like, oh, the mayor is going to come to this area because he cannot, um, we cannot allow the destruction of property. Um, and it's like the mayor's like, we can't allow the destruction of property when uh, the police murdered a black guy the next right. day, right? It's like a, that. It's a complicated answer to a simple question. So I don't, I don't know what the question you were asking. Anyway, my point is, I think the, the, that is in there to one, you know, when you see the end of this movie and you're like, why, you know, why did they have to do that to Sal? And he's like, well, why did that black guy have to, die? you know, why did Radio Rahim have to die? Yeah, um, but I took it as like, they didn't have to do that to Sal. And the fact that they did is not the right, wasn't the right answer. There's no right answer. The simple question is I who was in the wrong? A, and I think I, the I, answer is more complicated. I think, well, no, I, I mean, whether it's right or wrong, I think it's just a thing that it's a, it's a natural reaction to having people murdered over and over again by the government, I think is what the point would be. And so then we're at the next day. Um, you know, Samuel Jackson sort of summarizing, like, you know, are we, are we going to be able to live together? Are we, like, can we, can we move on from this? And um, Mookie stayed with Tina and then he has the final scene with Sal and, you know, we talked a little bit about it, but he's like, I want my money. And Sal's just so exasperated, throws $500 at him. And Mookie throws 200 back and he's like, I owe 50. And it's almost like this sort of like understanding and respect that Sal has for him for like. And it's only... almost played as like, funny. Thing. Yeah. It, well, it's played it funny when he grabs the $200 off the ground and takes it. But it's like this begrudging like, oh, OK, like you're, you know, maybe you you are growing up a little bit like you're you're taking what you think you're owed you're not taking more you know i i threw the money at you as a sign of disrespect and you're like i'm only going to take what i'm actually owed um and then he grabs the rest as sort of like the joke to to end it i think i think another thing in that scene that you know kind of says everything about the movie is that he says you know your place is okay because of the insurance the the insurance is going to cover it but like my friend is dead and he's never coming back. And that is like, there you go. Well, in the movie, I mean, and it's pointing out Sal, you know, Sal has been this guy who's cared about the mayor. He cares about Jade. He cares about Ahmad and letting them get pizza. And when push comes to shove, he cares more about the restaurant he built with his hands than the fact that radio is dead. Right. And I think that kind of says all, you know, the character that you felt is like the most of like, of an ally for black people is actually the movie is saying it's just, he's no different. Yeah. Um, so do you want to know who was, uh, considered for Sal? No, no. Yes, of course. Go ahead. Joe Montaigne and Joe Pesci. And then okay. Spike originally wanted Robert De Niro and Robert De Niro turned it down because he said it was too similar to, other parts he had played in the past and i was like what sir what parts are you talking yeah, about what parts i like i don't i mean maybe the way maybe he was gonna play it like fucking taxi driver i don't understand like <laughs> but or, or cape fear <laughs> i i don't i don't know who he was like this is um this is how i'm gonna do it lawrence fishburne was offered and turned down radio rahim which i mean lawrence fishburne's lawrence fishburne but honestly i think I think Radio Rahim, um, I don't know. I think he was kind of. It's funny when you say, Ray, it's funny when you say Lawrence Fishburne, because I'm thinking like, like now, like older Lawrence Fishburne, but he would have been the same age as all of them back then. I think Lauren Fishburne would have done great. Yeah, but I think Bill Nunn, who plays Radio Rahim, was pretty great in it. Um, James Earl Jones was originally offered to mayor, but turned it down. Mm, um, okay. Spike Lee's first choice for the role of Pino was Matt Dillon. So every one of these other ones... You could see Matt Dillon, too. Hold on. But every one of these other ones, you'd be like, oh, man, that would have been crazy. Robert De Niro. um, Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne and James Earl Jones. And then you're like, you know what? On this one, John Turturro, uh, you did better than Matt Dillon on this one. Um, 
But who, de- who who are you gonna say t- is like over the most overshadowing? Robert De Niro. Oh, okay. I mean, Robert De Niro is the Sal in this movie, and first of all, he's nominated for Best Actor, not Best Supporting, right? And I think no, Sal Sal the actor is nominated for Best Supporting. I'm saying De Niro would have been nominated for Best Actor, right? Oh, if you he think he would have just role, taken the okay? Yeah, I just because I I mean he's fucking Robert De Niro, so. Um, Delroy Lindo was offered uh, t- the chance to audition for one of the corner men, but he turned it down. Um, so there was there's this interesting story too, and this is like the last thing. Uh, the so this movie I think was originally with Paramount, maybe. Um, okay. and they wanted him to sort of soften up the movie. He told them to go fuck themselves, and so then he took it to Universal, and um this was supposed to be released in the summer and there were a lot of calls from critics of the movie saying that this was going to cause race riots, which Spike Lee was like, that's just fucking racist bullshit. Um, he's like, you don't think black people can handle this movie. And the president of universal was coming off the controversy from the last temptation of Christ where he needed bodyguard protection because people threatened his (laughs) and his family's life. And, and, um, literally and, uh, Christians, right? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think Last Temptation of Christ involves Christ. So, yeah. And yeah. then um, he said to his credit uh, that he was um, he the, they wanted him to move the date to the fall. And he's like, nah, it's going to be released when it's going to be released. And he like held his ground. So he he was like credit. Spike credited him with that. And I guess um, so Kim Basinger, it was released in the in the summer. Yeah. And then Kim Basinger um, at the Academy Awards was like talking about the movies nominated for best picture and then went off script and it was like the Academy didn't have the balls to nominate the actual best movie of this year, which was do the right thing. Holy shit. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but, but they, but he, they were uh, nominated for, for best screenplay, original screenplay, best original screenplay and best supporting actor, but not best picture. Yeah. I mean, yeah. best screenplay is the movie is like, that's a, that's an award they give to like the things they don't want to win best picture. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, you're not, we're not, oh, I don't know you about that. I mean, just look at the history of it, of the things that win that don't win best picture. Shit. Are you right? Cause I, my first thing I thought is spotlight. Well, yeah, some things are just, you know, they can't, you know, yeah, they just can't be denied. But I mean, Jojo rabbit won 2019 when, you know, it didn't have a chance of winning best picture that year. Right. It's yeah. like it, they spread the awards around. Um, Honestly, one of my favorite movies that we did this year was Jojo Rabbit. I just want to say I'm really looking forward to Spike Lee month, the rest of Spike Lee month. Um, I remember seeing tons of marketing commercials for Black Klansman. And I, I remember also being like, oh, I'm, I super want to see that. And I don't know what happened. I just ended up not ever seeing it. So I'm really excited now. I'm definitely going to see it. And um, and yeah, I you better I mean, fucking watch it. We're doing it at the end of this month. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's going to motivate me to actually fucking watch it. And um, I, I'm going to say one negative thing about Spike Lee. One. Is his adaptation of Old Boy is a piece of shit. But everything else, I'm, I'm excited for it. That movie's honestly grown on me. And I think it's just... So, what, I mean, this is like a much longer conversation about adapting. Like, first of all, adapting Korean movies in America is a fraught journey with like, because the storylines like the storylines of like a lot of Korean movies are just so fucking crazy. Um, but they're also then, like cemented in like their culture, like like things that would happen only in Asia or Korea. Private prisons and uh, tri- tricked incest. I mean, but like, I think one That's of the reasons that meant, but... one of the one of the reasons that movie is like so shit, right, is because it also has the original to live up to. Um, because I actually like, I don't know, I appreciate a lot of the craziness in that movie, but it's just like the the original is so amazing that I, I mean, I, one thing I was thinking about, I went through Spike's IMDb because I was like, what are like you know, what am I missing in here? And there's just a lot of movies that I had like never heard the title of. And it's like, I, you know, from like 2000 movies that were in like 2012, 2014, right. That I never fucking heard of. 
Um, and because so like 06 was Inside Man, and then I wa- I love that movie. And so when Miracle at St. Anna came out, which we're going to do this month too, in 08, I was fucking psyched for it. I remember going to the movie theater and like, you know, just I love that movie and it's not highly rated. And then there's some movies that came after that that I like 2012, 2014 that I literally never heard of. Um, and I think I don't know why that is. I think there Spike might have some opinions on why that is. <laughs> um, I've actually, you know, a, a recent movie that he made and I have heard of it um, because I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix is The Five Bloods. Yeah, I think that's his latest one, um, which, yeah, I, I need to watch, too. Uh, let's talk about Do the Right Thing. Uh, this movie, I mean, I think we've said it all before. Yeah. I don't, I think you could tell from the way we talked about it that one, we're both hugely impacted by it. It is kind of a movie that it's sort of rare to like live that much up to the hype of it, of like, you know, going into this, I was just like not expected to, to one, be as affected by it, but two, to like it as much as I did. Um, and it just it like lived up to all of the expectations of like, you know, a lot of people would probably say this is his best movie. Um, and yeah, it was just it was just I don't know, it was great. I, there's this uh, kind of this theme on Twitter right now going around being like, um, name a name a scene at the beginning of a movie that you saw that immediately told you it was going to be a great movie. And it's the opening credits of uh, Do the Right Thing for me. It's uh, Rosie Perez's pelvic thrusts to uh, the text of uh, director Spike Lee um, and the music and everything like that. It's just like when that starts, I was just like, I was like, damn, I'm excited for this film. Sit down and watch it. And then the the total shift of tone towards the end is shocking and relevant and so important important it's so important um but no i loved it i really liked it i actually liked it more than i thought i would which is always a good way to come out of a film you know one thing i'll say too is that um you know we're doing spike lee month and obviously for us two that look like this i think this was kind of a no one knows what we look like on the internet so we're white and it was a i think it was a tough start i think we dot like dance through the raindrops pretty well um but you know we made I think it we were do- fair tough we made it we made it through fair. we made it through do the right thing and now it's going to get a little easier when next we do malcolm x <laughs> so thanks for listening to another episode of i finally watched this is david and this is alan and we finally watched do the right thing